Hi, this is Carl Moore from McGill University in Montreal, Canada, and Oxford University at the Green Templeton College, where I've been a member for about 25, 30 years now after being there five years full time. What I'm going to focus on is my latest research on introverts, ambiverts, and extroverts as leaders. So let me go here to my second slide. And talk about what I've been researching for the last number of years has been leadership since my PhD back in the late mid nineties. I've been studying CEO leadership particularly, but in the last 10 years, I've learned the most from three groups. One is indigenous leaders. And I started a column in the Globe and Mail, Canada's national newspaper with an indigenous graduate student about uh, 10, 11 months ago now, where every two weeks we interview an indigenous leader because they've been an area that has been neglected by many leaders. Another one is I have a book on Generation Z coming out, and it's called OK Boomer, How to Effectively Work with Millennials and Generation Z. So something that really we've got to learn a lot more from the Generation Z and their approach to work and to life. And the final one here, sorry about that, is Introverted Leaders, and that's what we're going to focus on today. And thanks again for the University of South Florida for the opportunity to do this. So the research base is a good professor is about 450 plus interviews of C-suite executives in North America, Europe and Asia. So some of our names you might recognize like Justin Trudeau, Sir Richard Branson, Mohammed Yunus, uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner and so on. But most of them are just executives at the C-suite. So uh, many of them are CEOs. I have a CEO radio show and uh, do a CEO column as well for a number of years. So have access through the class, through my radio show to CEOs, which is one of the problems of studying senior executive leadership is getting access to them, but through the class and whatnot, be able to crack that one. Also think that I'm older, more their age, or perhaps even a little bit older than some of them, so that it's more of a conversation of equals as opposed to a PhD student as I was, you know, a few decades ago. So that's the research base and the central construct of what we're looking at is introverts and extroverts. The central construct is a sensitivity to stimulation. So introverts love people, love being with people, but after a certain amount of stimulation of being with people, they tip over and go, enough of that. They've got to take what we call introvert breaks. They've got to get away from the stimulation. And so they seek introvert breaks and things like going for a walk by themselves, walking a dog, sitting and reading a book where they recharge their batteries. Now, extroverts is something we less think about, but they seek out stimulation. And I'm very much an extrovert that I seek out stimulation. I look for it. Now, it's something when I looked into it, I saw introverts got introvert breaks, but there's nothing in the literature about extrovert breaks. So what we academics call a gap in the literature. So it's very exciting for us at least. And what I realized is that I take extrovert breaks. So after sitting, writing a book, ironically, about introverts for a couple hours in my office, I go down one floor where there's an endless supply of undergrads on the undergrad lounge, many of whom I am teaching, admittedly, giving a grade to. So there's a self-interest there. Where I'm happy to chat with them. And I fill up my energy. I fill up my battery by being with people. In fact, some of the undergrads who've heard me give talks will tease me and say, go, extrovert break? Because they realize I'm there to recharge. One other example of an extrovert break is when I travel and I'm without my family, rather than sit and eat in the restaurant, I'll typically eat at the bar so I can talk to total strangers, which once they learn I'm a professor, that everybody seems very relaxed and happy to chat with me and just someone who is not is bright, but not all that practical at times. So they it's, it gets kind of amusing at times, but I'm happy to get, the, get those extrovert breaks. So we, one of the key points is this is a bell curve. So some people are very extroverted, some people are very introverted, but most people are more in the middle of that curve, not really extroverted, not really introverted, but in the middle. And one other point I'll make before I go on is that if you have a hammer, everything is a nail, is a famous saying. Now, if you were in my house here, you'd see at my backyard here, just out the back window, there's a, a fence around our backyard, which I fixed a couple of years ago. And I was putting in a screw with a hammer because I'd run out of nails. And an elderly neighbor came by and he said, Carl, that's wrong. Almost morally wrong that I was misusing the screw. 
And his point was a very fair one that a screw is better fastening device than a nail if you use a screwdriver to fasten the two pieces of wood together. And so I was kind of misusing the use of the screw. So as a good worker, you've got to have a hammer, you have a nail, you have a screwdriver, you have um, a saw, all sorts of tools. I'm not a great handyman, so I've run out of examples already. But when you look at human beings, we're wonderfully complex. So we think about things about gender, we think about race, we think about the professional area you're part of, you think of where you are in the hierarchy, you think about age and generations. I'm writing about my book on Generation Z's. So introvert, extrovert, ambivert is just one element of that. So let's not get too excited about it because human beings are wonderfully complex. And if we ask your partner or your children or, or people like that, you go, Susan, incredibly complex, but whether one is more introverted or extroverted or ambiverted, we'll get to that term in a minute, isn't an important thing, but don't overdo it. So look at people through that particular set of lenses, then take them off and think about another set, perhaps their profession or their, the culture they come from and the culture they live in. So it's important, but let's not overdo it. But in spite of that, I'm going to press forward and talk about this concept at greater length now. An interesting point is that they did some research on babies at Harvard and followed them for many years. So you looked at three, four month old babies and the response to stimulation. And it was a reasonably good predictor of someone to be an extrovert or more of an introvert based on the response to stimulation as a baby. So it's something which is somewhat inherited and it's something, not entirely, but it's something which is in our DNA and our genes to a considerable degree. Important thing I think to realize. Okay, let's move on then. So there's a short test, and if I was doing this, I've done it, you know, I've taught this at Stanford, Harvard, and Oxford, and other top uh, business schools around the world. I would ask you to do this test and go into small groups and discuss what you are, perhaps with colleagues or friends that might laugh at you think you're an introvert, where no, you're a big extrovert and things like that. But it's something where you would take a short test to understand where you are on that spectrum. But in this case, I won't because we, we don't have that luxury. But I want to focus on what are some of the common characteristics, the things that make introverts and extroverts stand out from each other. And again, it's a bell curve, so it depends where you are on that curve. So introverts tend to like to focus on one thing at a time. Extroverts, because it's stimulate, stimulating, rather, prefer multitasking. They like to have multiple balls in the air, because it's stimulating. Introverts tend to be a bit more reserved. What they like to do is think of things through, connect the dots, before they come to conclusion. So they tend to pull back and be more reserved. Extroverts tend to be more enthusiastic. They seek the spotlight. They get their ideas out there. Now, how I think of ideas, I go see my manager. And my last manager was an introvert, so I learned not to do this. But I think aloud. So I'll find someone who doesn't mind it, perhaps someone who works for me. And I'll have 10 ideas in 15 minutes. I'll bounce all over the wall with ideas. Eight are done. But I'm not embarrassed. One is all right, one is good to excellent. That's the thing I value, but how I think is I think aloud. And I bounce off the wall with ideas. I have lots of dumb ideas. Introverts think before they speak. They like to connect the dots and think it through, which means that, I mean, they have just as many dumb ideas, I'm sure, they just don't mention them aloud. They don't say them because they go, I have the good sense not to say ideas. Where I, as an extrovert, seek the stimulation of an audience, but I don't need that. You know, at the end of the time, I might say, Susan, that was really helpful. And Susan will dryly say, Carl, I didn't say a word, which is overstating it a bit, but there's some truth to enough where both laugh. Introverts prefer writing because they want to think about things. So I would email an introvert a day or two before a meeting and saying, we're going to discuss this. Here's a couple of articles. What do you think? And in fact, in a meeting with an introvert that works with me, I'll look at them. And what I'm doing is saying, are you ready to comment? And if they will, they'll just give a slight nod or they'll go no. And if they nod no, I won't call on them because they've told me no, they're not ready yet. But when I do call on them, be later in the meeting and they will tend to have excellent, well thought out ideas that we're delighted to hear. With extroverts are ready to go at the beginning of the meeting, it would be funny, it'll be full of energy, may not get too much, but it'll get us started out there. 
So extroverts prefer talking. Introverts tend to be cautious decision makers where extroverts like me just go for it, which gets us in trouble. Now the downside of the introvert is paralysis by analysis. They never get to a decision because they keep looking for more facts. So these are both strengths introverts and experts have, but they're also occasional weaknesses you've got to be aware of if you're one or you manage one or you're managed by one. Recharge, we've already talked to already. Introverts tend to prefer to avoid conflict because it's uh, too much stimulation where extroverts don't mind a bit of conflict because it is stimulating. It's something that they kind of enjoy. So these are some of the key differences between introverts and extroverts. And again, it's a bell curve. Not everyone's going to act all this way but it's something where it gives you some sense of where we're coming from typically. Now I want to bring a new concept, a new idea, at least for some of you called ambiverts. It was invented in the 1920s and really disappeared from the literature until 2003, Adam Grant, who's a prophet, uh, Wharton and a couple of colleagues uh, from Harvard did a study at salespeople and said, and used the term ambivert and said, salespeople among the best sales per, uh, people rather are ambiverts because and I was in sales at IBM, was taught this many years ago that the first part of a sales call is to listen to the needs of the client. So that's more introverted, listening quietly, gathering your facts, where once you realize it, and you hope it, you do in fact find this as a salesperson, that there's a, need, uh, a meeting of the need of the client and your product, then you act extroverted and you're excited about your product and how it's great for the customer, the potential customer. But it's largely disappeared from the literature other than that one piece of literature. But I've been looking at it and I found a new term. So I was excited, ambivert. So the next 20 uh, senior executives I interviewed, I managed uh, to tell them, I told them at the beginning what ambivert was. Every single one said, Carl, I'm an ambivert, which statistically is highly unlikely. And in fact, just couldn't be true. Because when I look at it, one would, might guess that it's a third, a third, a third third introverts, third ambiverts, third extroverts. But I found that it was probably about a 40% introverts on that curve, 40% on the extroverted part of the curve. About 20% of people are genuine ambiverts. But that's just kind of my sense of a few hundred interviews about this. So in ambivert, we've talked about looking for stimulation where extroverts look for stimulation, introverts prefer calm. We've talked about decision-making, action to Deliberation. Now, an ambivert is someone who can act like an introvert at times and like an extrovert at other times. So the title of my book I'm writing for Stanford is We're All Ambiverts Now. What I'm arguing based on hundreds of interviews is that most senior executives are naturally more introverted and naturally more extrovert. Only about 20% in my senses are, are ambiverts. But as a senior executive, you've got to act like an ambivert. That is to say, if you're a CEO and you go to a meeting, and I've talked to dozens and dozens of CEOs about this, as a boardroom where you're discussing strategy. As CEO, I know already what I know, what I want to know, what everybody else is saying. But if I walk in as typical extrovert and just put out my ideas, it tends to end all conversation. People go, well, that's why you're the CEO, Carl. I love it. Where a good CEO acts like an introvert in a strategy meeting and says, Susan, what do you say? Jim, what do you say? And you go around the room learning from everyone. Happy thought, I'm the CEO at the end, I get to decide the strategy. But I came in knowing what I knew and I've learned from the conversation, but I had to listen as an introvert. So in that case, I've got to act like an introvert even though I'm extroverted. In other circumstances, a good introvert has got to act like an extrovert and start the meeting off with some energy and enthusiasm and excitement and positive kind of stirring comments has got to learn to lead a discussion at times. So it depends on the behavior required, which you want to be. What I'm saying is that we've got to act like ambiverts. There's only a limited number of us that are genuine ambiverts. So this kind of gives you a sense of what I said earlier, that there's only probably 20, 25% of the population of executives are genuine ambiverts, because that's who I research and talk to. Now, brings us to the rubber band theory, the idea that we need to be able to stretch ourselves but if we go too far, we'll snap. So let me give you a couple examples of well-known introverted CEOs that act like extroverts. So Justin Droz, the Prime Minister of Canada, 
I came to McGill about 21 years ago, just right after Justin graduated from McGill, and I did some things with him. So I got to know him when he was a young man. I didn't know he'd become prime minister. I probably would have been friendlier in retrospect, but his dad had been prime minister. I should have guessed, but c'est la vie. So I said to Justin, are you an introvert or extrovert? When I interviewed him for my radio show. And he said, I'm an introvert. So I rolled my eyes. I know him well enough. I, I'm an older guy. I could get away with that. Probably wouldn't do that today. Now that he's been prime minister for five years. But he said, I'm an introvert who's learned to be an extrovert. I'm so perfectly happy to be in the corner and read a good book and be on my own, go for a walk in woods or a long hike. Typical introvert breaks. It's really deeply satisfying me versus the fact my job is very much being a people person. He's prime minister and everybody knows who he is in Canada and indeed around the world. He's one of the best looking prime ministers in the world, if I could boast as a Canadian. And I like people, introverts too. I like exchanging with that's when I'm on. I'm doing the work I need to do. And given the choice, I'd like a small group of friends that I can kick back and relax with. So that's the nature of Justin Trudeau. Now, Mohammed Yunus, Nobel Peace Prize winner, he, he's been to Montreal once or twice a year for years now, and I've had him to class. So I know him a bit, and he's you know a little older than me, but we're a similar age, at least a bit. And I was at his hotel, the Sofitel, three or four people in the room, and I asked him, is it introvert or extrovert? And the three or four people, before he could answer, laugh at the foolishness of my question. And I said, Mohammed, I've seen you work a room. I've seen you give an inspiring speech. Be like an extrovert. And he said, Carl, he said, I guess I'm an introvert. Yes, I'm an introvert, but I've been helping millions of the poorest women and children on earth. How could I not act like an extrovert? So you say, good person doing the right thing. But both are examples where they're introverts, but because of who they are, they, in order to help people and to do their jobs, in, in Justin's case as prime minister, act like an extrovert. Exactly the right thing to do. And what I'm saying is that we're all ambiverts now as an executive. Now, some people can't do this, and that's fine. I'm on the board of a small AI company. Go program as an AI program. We pay them a lot of money, hard to find, very scarce people, so very valuable. We don't want them schmoozing each other or working a crowd unless you know, it's part of the personality, but most tend to be introverted because of, if you're an AI programmer, you tend to be someone who's heads down, you're drawn to that because that's what you love to do. Now onto my next slide and I'm almost done. So there's a cultural overlay here. You know, I'm talking to people from all over the world. Um, I have three personalities to some degree. Grew up in Toronto, but lived in LA and Boston for university. So six years in the States. Five years, we lived in England and taught at Oxford. So I got a British accent, learned to, uh, so when I go to England, I get a British accent. I'm quieter and more sarcastic. When I move, when I go down to New York, particularly New York, not LA, but New York or Boston on business, I'm actually noisier, which my students find hard to fathom. So I adjust it based on the culture I'm in. So I took some students just before the pandemic to Tokyo, Bangkok, and Hong Kong. And my theory, we, Miguel has an MBA in Tokyo, so I've taught there about eight times. Is in Japan, it's the same bell curve, but it's more introverted, but there's very extroverted Japanese. And in Thailand, it's the same bell curve, but Thai are more extroverted, which the executives we talked to in both countries agreed with that analysis. And my students and I observed that to be true in those cultures. Okay, last slide, just three key takeaway. One, introverts love you. Our traditional view of Leadership has been extroverts, but that's evolved over the last 20 years. Susan Cain's book, Quiet, has been you know, really helpful. And I work with Susan, great person, reader material, really a great thinker. Secondly, we're all born that way. I think I'm chanting a Lady Gaga song here, but we can relax. I'm an extreme extrovert. It's my hard wiring. I've got to be an adult, act like an ambivert. But c'est la vie. That's the way I am. I need to accept it. And third point is... But we have to be an adult and act like an ambivert at times. Around grade three or four, you lose your name when you go to your kid's school because you're no longer Carl, you're Eric's father because he's more important in that context. And if you get upset about that, we say, grow up, be an adult. In the same way, <clears throat> as we get older, as we get more senior in the hierarchy, we need to learn to act like an introvert at times and an extrovert at times in order to be an effective leader or dean or professor. Appreciate the time and the very kind invitation from the University of South Florida. 
If you have any questions, please email me at Carl, that's with a K, dot Moore, M-O-O-R-E, at McGill, M-C-G-I-L-L dot C-A. I have an email where you can spell every part wrong. That's why I spelled it out for you. Thanks for your time and attention today.